Yeah, so hi, as Frank just said, today I'm going to talk to you about musical robot swarms. And perhaps in contrast to some of the other lectures that you've received this week, rather than talking to you about a specific technique or a specific algorithm, I want to talk to you about a domain of intelligence. And in fact, we might use a variety of different techniques and algorithms to approach intelligence in this domain. And the domain of intelligence I'm interested in is musical intelligence. What kind of knowledge and skills do we need in order to play music? And as it turns out, swarms have a lot of nice properties. There are a lot of properties that arise naturally in swarms, which are also desirable in the context of music. So what I want to talk to you about today is what are some of these nice properties of swarms and how can we use those to imbue machines with at least some small amount of musical intelligence. And so I think most of you probably already know that in robotics when we talk about swarms, what we mean is the idea that if you want to do something complex. Sometimes it makes sense to use a whole bunch of simple robots, and even if no robot by itself is capable of doing anything complex, if you have a whole bunch of simple robots, then maybe together they can do something that's more than the sum of the parts. And of course, the complex thing that I want to do with my robots is make music. And again, if you just Google swarms, one of the first thing you'll find is this Craig Reynolds Boyd's flocking simulation algorithm, which again, I think many of you have probably seen this, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about how it works, but I just want to point out a few nice properties of this algorithm. Uh, the first nice property is that it's simple, like each, each individual agent here is just following a simple set of rules you know, move towards the center of the flock and avoid collisions. And that's basically it. And so maybe, yeah, simplicity is always kind of a desirable property, especially if you're lazy like I am. Um, another nice property here is just that it's pleasing to look at, right? There's a certain sort of aesthetic beauty about this. Um, there's this, yeah, kind of beautif beautifully patterned visual, yeah, thing going on. And of course, this kind of pleasingness is also desirable in the context of music. And it's kind of interesting to think about how you would make a sound that's kind of pleasing in the same way that this is pleasing to look at. Okay, and maybe one final nice property about this is that it has a nice blend of structure and randomness. Like if you zoom in and look closely at the individual agents, there's quite a bit of randomness in the movement, but when you zoom out and look at the whole thing, uh, the whole swarm is kind of moving in this very almost predictable and structured way. And this is also, you also see this in music, a lot of really good music has more structure at large scales and more kind of randomness at smaller scales. And so it's not surprising, perhaps, that many, many people have tried to use this Boyd's algorithm to create music more or less directly. And perhaps the most common way that people have done this is just by superimposing parameters of sound or parameters of music kind of directly onto the space that the Boyd's are moving around in. So in this example, imagine that each agent has a continuous sound associated with it. So like beep, and then the position of that agent on the x-axis controls the frequency of that sound. So like beep, and then the position of that agent on the y-axis controls the loudness of that sound. So like beep. Um, so as you know, as that one agent kind of navigates around this space, you know, it's varying its, its pitch and loudness as it moves around. And then you have a whole bunch of these agents uh, kind of doing the same thing. And yeah, so I'm going to show you, I'll just play an example of this. And this might be really loud. So if you're on Zoom, uh, you might want to turn down your volume. 
yeah, I'll put my volume kind of low to start with. Okay, so the first thing I want to say about this is that it sounds awesome. It sounds so good. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that this has maybe some of the properties that I just mentioned, but not all. You know, I think some of the problem, the, some of the properties that you have in the, the visual animation come through, and maybe some of them don't come through. But clearly this has some limitations as well. You know, the main limitation is just that this doesn't sound like any other music. Um, you know, maybe that's a benefit if you're a computer musician and you're looking for some weird, like exotic sounds. Um, but if you're trying to compose music in the style of Mozart, like this technique is never gonna work for that because this is not how the music of Mozart works, okay? Um, and maybe one other kind of limitation of this is that it has always it always strikes me as being a little superficial to just like superimpose musical parameters on something that's not like kind of inherently musical. If you see what I'm saying, like the agents here don't really know anything about music and the music doesn't really have much to do with, you know, the agents which are moving around in physical space. So I, I guess I want to say there's like an extrinsic relationship between the agents and the music. And so in my own research, I've been interested in this question of how can I deal with some of the limitations here? Like how can I kind of get rid of the spatial metaphor of agents like moving around in Euclidean space? And how can I kind of create a swarm where the agents actually kind of know something about music? And so to study this in a little bit more de detail, I built these robots, which I call Dr. Squiggles. And you would have seen a few photographs of these on Monday, although we didn't really talk about it in much detail. And so I actually made 10 of these robots and there are eight of them here. But in the research that I'm about to show you and a lot of the research, I'm just using three robots at a time. And some of you might argue that three robots doesn't really constitute a swarm, like usually you want a lot of robots. Um, but I would counter argue that it's not about the number of robots you have, it's kind of about how the system scales as you add more robots. So however many robots you have in the swarm, you should be able to add another robot that automatically join in and start behaving in the desired way. Um, and three is kind of the minimum number of robots that I can use to start studying some of the things that I'm interested in. And so these robots are really just, it's really just a Raspberry Pi computer. So for the sake of this lecture, Dr. Squiggles is just a fancy housing for a small Linux computer. And so if that helps you think about it, whenever I talk about the robot, you can just take in your mind, they're talking about a small computer. Um, and this is important because later it's going to allow the robots to be fully autonomous. I'm not sure if I would say autonomy is a property of swarms, but I think autonomy is actually kind of like a prerequisite for swarms. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so each robot is listening through a microphone. It's just a USB microphone plugged into the USB port of the Raspberry Pi computer. And this image is a little misleading because that's the wrong kind of microphone. Uh, in the examples I'm going to show you in a moment, I'm just using kind of a regular, like, yeah, just a regular USB microphone. 
And so the microphone is important because I want my robots, or I want a swarm of these robots to have the property of stigmergy. And stigmergy means that the robots are communi communicating with each other through the environment. So just as ants deposit pheromones in the environment, and then other ants detect traces of those pheromones and kind of respond to, to, to those. Um, similarly, I want my robots to deposit sound into the environment and the other robots to detect and respond to the traces of sound that's left in the environment by other robots. And these robots have, um, I, I built a few different instruments for them to play. And in the first examples I'm going to show you, I have my robots playing these miniature pipe organs. And so these tall things sticking up here are organ pipes. And I brought one here to show you. So I don't know if the Zoom people can see this. You guys can see this. So yeah. And yeah, so these are kind of 3D printed and laser cut. And the way that this works is that underneath the table here, this wooden box that's under the table is an air supply. So there's like a fan in there and the fan blows air through all the piping that's kind of under the table there. And then the air comes into these wooden boxes that the robots are sitting on. And then those boxes have holes in them and the holes have little electromechanical valves underneath them. And the valves are connected to the Raspberry Pi and the robot. So the robots can kind of open and close the valves to allow air to go through, if that makes any sense. And then the organ pipes kind of go down into those holes. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that the robots aren't playing music through a speaker or something like that. They're making real, like physical acoustic sound by blowing air through these organ pipes. And each robot has eight organ pipes. And that's kind of important so because each each robot then can only play eight notes and uh, the reason that's important because eight isn't really enough notes to play any really interesting music uh, most music has more than eight notes in it um, but if you have a lot of these robots if you have three or ten or a hundred robots like this and they all have different notes then there should be plenty of notes cumulatively but the robots are going to need to figure out how to work together to be able to create music. Okay, the kind of key property that I put here is heterogeneity. So each robot has slightly different capabilities than the other robots. And again, they need to be able to use their own capabilities kind of in conjunction with the other robots. And you might say that this is kind of an artificial constraint that I'm imposing on this system so that I can study the things that I'm interested in. Okay. <laughs> And so the first little bit of intelligence that these robots have um, is self-awareness. And what I mean by that is that the organ pipes are interchangeable. So I can take an organ pipe out and give it to a different robot. Like I can switch all the organ pipes around if I want to. And so the robots need to know which pipes they have. Um, and in fact, they can figure that out. And so I'm going to play you a quick example of this. And what you'll see in this example, so the one, the blue robot that is on the end here is going to play each of its notes in succession, one note at a time. And then that robot is listening to itself through uh, this microphone. And yeah, and then so this terminal window that you see in the foreground is kind of a terminal into that robot's Raspberry Pi. And each time it plays a note, it's going to print out a line that says like what it thinks that note is. So I will play this.
background. So I recognize that this terminal window is probably too small to see, but for instance, for the first note, it printed out a line saying that it thinks that that's note number 74, which happens to be a D. And the next line, it says, it thinks that note is note number 68, which happens to be an A flat and so forth. And those are all correct. So, and then the robot kind of stores all of that information in a little text file somewhere that it can access later. So now the robot knows kind of what its own capabilities are. And it figured that out just by kind of examining itself in a way. And so just as the first kind of little warm up, I you know wanted to be able to play music with my robots. So I built this system where I can play the guitar and whatever notes I play on the guitar, the robots will just play exactly the same thing that I'm playing, or they'll play the same notes. And the way this system works is this one actually kind of has my laptop in the mix and my laptop is figuring out which notes I'm playing. And then whenever I play a note, my laptop kind of broadcasts out a message saying like, hey, does anybody know how to play this note? And then if any of the robots actually have that particular note, then it will play it. Um, so I will play you an example. So um, I guess the one kind of nice property about this system is that it has this scalability, which I mentioned before. So clearly if I play a note on the guitar that's too high or too low, no robot is gonna have that note because I didn't make any really high or low organ pipes. So if I had more robots with higher and lower pitches, I could more or less just kind of add, the, add them to this system and they would automatically start behaving in the desired way. Now, having said that, this system really has almost no intelligence and almost no swarm-like properties because the robots are just kind of stupidly playing whatever note I play. I mean, I'm just telling them what to do. They have no kind of autonomy. And also because my laptop is in the mix, this system isn't really distributed. It's really just my laptop is kind of doing all of the computation. And yeah, in this system, the robots aren't even using the microphones, which I spent three minutes telling you about just a moment ago. Um, so clearly we can improve on both the intelligence yeah, and the swarm-like properties in, of this system. And so to start looking at this a little bit more about how we can imbue this with more intelligence, we built this system, so a new system. And in this system, what I wanna be able to do is play chords on the guitar. Like I wanna be able to strum chords and I want the robots to play a melody. And by a melody, I mean that even though there are three robots, I only want one note to be sounding at a time. So somehow the robots are going to have to work together to figure out which note or which robot should be playing. Okay. And so the algorithm that we're using, so each robot is listening through its microphone. And for each little blip of audio that comes in, well, suppose that I'm sitting there playing chords. So this audio has like a little blip of me playing a chord. Um, then the robot tries to classify what chord I'm playing. And it's using some kind of classical signal processing thing for this. So this isn't a machine learning thing. It's just a yeah, signal processing thing. And so then once the robot has figured out what's, what chord I'm playing, it tries to decide what the next melody note should be. 
Um, and the next melody note should be one of the several notes that's in the chord that I'm playing. And it should be that note, which is kind of minimally distant from the previous melody note, if that, that makes any sense at all. Um, and so the point here is that, again, each robot is running its own copy of this algorithm. And hopefully, all the robots agree about which note should be played next. Um, but because only one robot at most would actually have an organ pipe with that note, then like clearly only one robot would actually play that note. Um, yeah. So I hope that's clear. If not, I'm going to play you an example. And yeah, maybe I should pause to tell you something important, which is is that this is Halvor. This is this one is work that Halvor did over the summer. And some of you may know him because he's your fellow Robin master student. So yeah, this is very, this is quite a nice system. I, I quite like this and it's really nice to actually play music with. Um, and so clearly this has a lot of nice properties. I mean, it has like many of the properties that the previous thing that I showed you didn't have. So obviously this is a lot more intelligent. The robots are really kind of behaving autonomously. Like my laptop isn't involved. You know, the robots are all listening through their microphones and kind of making their own decisions about what they should do. Um, so this is a lot more intelligent and a lot more swarm like than the previous thing that I showed you. Um, if there's one kind of limitation to this system, at least from a theoretical perspective, it's that the robots aren't really like coordinating with one another about which robot should play. This kind of just depends you just kind of have to hope that all of the robots agree about what note should come next. Um, and that works because the algorithm is robust enough that it just does happen to work. Um, the robots do usually agree, but at least from a theoretical perspective, it would be nice if the robots were kind of negotiating with one another, or somehow kind of working with one another in real time to figure out who should play what. Um, and so I built a new system where I try to approach this a little bit more. And so this system is kind of the opposite of what I just showed you. So rather than me playing chords and having the robots play a melody in this system, I'm going to play, I want to be able to play a melody on the guitar, like one note at a time. And for each note I play, I want the robots to play a chord. So in other words, all three robots could be playing at the same time. And so the way that, that this algorithm works, so again, each robot is listening through its microphone. And for each little blip of audio that comes in through the microphone, I, well, I take the spectrum of that. Uh, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, but for the sake of argument, just suppose that I take the spectrum of that blip of audio and feed that more or less directly into the inputs of some kind of neural network. And then what I want to come out of my network is a numerical representation of the note that this robot should play. Okay. So what you have coming in is audio and what you have coming out is a number that represents what the note that the robot's gonna play. 
And the note that the robot plays might not be present in the audio. Like it might be that I'm playing one note on the guitar and the robot decides that there's a different note that would be a good accompaniment for that note. So it's kind of trying to harmonize. Um, yeah. I think that was all I was gonna say about that. And so the way that I train this or the data set that I'm using to train this is I'm using a whole bunch of music of jazz Bach. And this music, all of it has four simultaneous melodies. Okay. And so I'll just quickly play what this sounds like. Okay, and so during training, what I do is I select some of those melodies at random, and I put the audio of those into my neural network. Okay, and I'm kind of feeding the audio in sequentially, like one little blip of audio at a time. And then what I hope to get out, the output of my neural network, is one of the other melodies. So what the effect of this should be is the network should learn how to create a harmonization harmonization for whatever it hears. So, you know, if you have a couple of notes going in, then, then the robot should think, okay, maybe this is a note that I could play that goes along with that. Okay. And so, yeah, I have this algorithm running on all three of my robots, and I'll just play a short example of what this kind of sounds like. Okay, so this thing has a lot of nice properties. And one property that I want to talk about in more detail is self-organization. And what I mean by this is that the robots kind of spontaneously self-organize into chords. Okay, the robots here are playing chords, but those chords aren't programmed in anywhere. And I want to take just a moment to kind of look at this in slow motion. And so you can kind of see how this self-organization process works. Okay, so suppose that I play the note A on the guitar. Probably all of these robots think that E is a good note to accompany that A. Because that's like the most common thing that would occur in the data set. It's like the most probable thing but only one robot would actually have that note E. So only that robot would play the note. Okay, so now these other two robots can hear my A and the first robot's E. Um, and so they probably no longer think that, that E is a good note for them to play, okay? Because they, they can hear something different now. And so now maybe they think that the next A up is a good note to play. But again, only one of these robots, at most only one of these robots would actually have that A. And if it does, it'll play it. Okay. And so the first robot now kind of has the opportunity to change what note it's playing if it wants to. Um, yeah, it could, it could change the different note or for the sake of argument, just assume that it keeps thinking that E is a good note for it to play. Then the last robot now can hear, can hear all of these notes. So maybe it changes its mind again. And now it thinks that C sharp is a good note for it to play. And I don't know, I guess it's not likely that this robot would actually have the note C sharp, but in this case, by some miracle it does. And so it plays it. And so in that way, you get a whole chord. And this process that I just described kind of plays out really quickly in real time. And so I just want to kind of show you what it looks like, yeah, as, as it actually happens. So again, the chords 
you know, that A major chord that the robots are playing isn't programmed in anywhere, but the robots are just kind of negotiating with each other in real time about how, you know, how can each robot use its own capabilities to fill up the musical space kind of based on what, how all the other robots are using their capabilities to fill up the musical space. Okay, so self-organization. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I should also say that this, this also displays this property of stigmergy, which I talked about a little bit before. Again, each robot is kind of depositing sound into the environment, and then the other robots are detecting that sound and changing their behavior based on what they hear. Okay, one other nice property of this system is adaptability. And what I mean by that is that since the chords aren't programmed in anywhere, every time I play that note A guitar, the robots might settle on a different chord. So they might not always play that same A major chord to accompany my note A. Um, and yeah, so I'll play a little quick video that shows you kind of what that looks like. a different chord each time I play that note. And that's desirable in the context of music because that's how real music works. Like in real music, it's not the case that every time you play one note, you get the same chord. That would get boring really quickly. So this kind of models in some sense the way that real music works. And maybe I should also say that because I'm using an LSTM neural network, which models sequences, the hope is that, um, the robots would kind of select which chords to play based on all the music that's come before. Um, that turns out not to be working great at the moment, but that's kind of the direction I'm going in with that. Okay, so I, yeah, so I told you before that my robots have several instruments that they can play. So I want to forget about pipe organs for now. Well, for the rest of this lecture, I want to forget about the pipe organs and show you these other robots which are playing glockenspiels. And the way this works is that these robots actually just tap. Okay, they just kind of make tapping sounds. So the robots have these uh, solenoids around their legs and the solenoid, you apply voltage to it and the solenoid just ejects and kind of quickly strikes whatever surface the robot happens to be sitting on. So these robots don't know anything about pitch. This is kind of a rhythmic thing. All they do is, is kind of make these like short percussive sounds. And so these robots are listening to each other through contact microphones. And a contact microphone is basically a special type of microphone that just allows one robot to listen to exactly one other robot and not be able to hear anything else. So you have to imagine that off to the side of this image, there's another robot, say robot A is off to the side, and robot A is projecting this microphone out to robot B, such that robot A can only hear robot B and nothing else. And then I've set these robots up in a loop such that robot A is listening to robot B, B listens to C, and C listens back to A. Okay, so yeah, each one can only hear its neighbor. And I want these robots to play rhythm together. And so the algorithm that I use to generate rhythms is based on a histogram. So the way that this works is that at least for the purposes of this example, a rhythm consists of 16 time steps. Digga, 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 sorry. Digga, 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 digga. Okay, at each time step, the robot can either tap or not tap. And whether or not the robot taps on a particular time step depends on the values of like the corresponding histogram values, which are in the center of this graph. 
And the histogram values are determined by what this robot hears its neighbor play. So if the neighbor taps on the first time step, then that kind of increments the corresponding histogram value. And if the neighbor doesn't tap on the first time step, then that uh, histogram value will kind of be decremented. And then the, all of the histogram values are related to the probability that this robot is going to play or is going to tap on the corresponding time step, if that makes sense. So each robot is listening to its neighbor and trying to play something that's similar but not necessarily identical to what the neighbor is playing. And so I'm going to play an example of this. Yeah, so this is kind of one trial. And in the beginning, all of the robots histograms are initialized to just random values. And then slowly they kind of adapt to one another and you can hear what happens. Okay, so yeah, so I think you can hear what happened there. The robots all started out playing something different, but over time what they were playing got more and more similar and eventually the robots just started playing the same thing. Like each robot was playing the same thing as the other robots and it was playing that thing over and over and over again. And so I've depicted that kind of here on the top, uh, the top graph of this slide. And so this, graph has kind of it has time on the x axis and then on the y axis is some kind of binary encoding of this 16 time step rhythm so each little dot represents like one complete 16 time step rhythm and yeah again you can see they the robots all start out playing different rhythms from each other and different rhythms on consecutive time steps or con yeah consecutive you see what i'm saying and then they kind of gradually converge until they're all playing the same thing. And so the property here is, well, kind of convergence or equilibrium, like the robots have reached some equilibrium. And I guess this equilibrium, so the first thing I wanna say about this is that this seems to be like a relatively inherent property of swarms. And I don't know that, I'm not sure if this has been proven mathematically, or maybe some of you know about this more than I do, but to me, it seems, almost inevitable that when you have a system like this, that it's like almost guaranteed to reach some kind of equilibrium if you don't like deliberately kind of disrupt that. Um, and equilibrium is a nice property in some respects in the context of music because, because there's repetition in music, like music is full of repetition. And this process of deciding what to repeat is at least similar to the process of composing music. But obviously this equilibrium also has a downside, which is that very few music, you know, actually just settles on one thing and then does that one thing for the rest of eternity. So if you're de designing a system like this, maybe that's something you need to think about. Um, and so the other two graphs that I have here represent different trials um, so what I didn't tell you is that this histogram algorithm has a few hyperparameters, and so the other two graphs there represent kind of different set, yeah, different values for the hyperparameters. And the bottom one is particularly interesting because it did settle on some kind of equilibrium, like there's something that's being repeated over and over again, but the thing that's being repeated is actually eight rhythms long, like eight eight rhythms where each rhythm is like 16 time steps um, and what's interesting about that is that each robot is kind of only using enough memory to store one rhythm like that histogram is only kind of one rhythm long 
and there are only three robots. So cumulatively in the whole network, there's only enough memory to store three rhythms in any given moment in time. But somehow you end up with this, this pattern that's eight rhythms long, even though there's not enough memory anywhere in the network for that to be stored. Um, and so this, in fact, just kind of pops out of the network dynamics. And so the property here is emergence. Emergence, well, it's a little bit hard to define very carefully, but it has something to do, again, with the sum or the, the whole being more than the sum of the parts. And so in this case, the sum of the parts is that you have enough memory for three rhythms, and what comes out is, is an eight rhythm pattern. Yeah, so I might say that the robots are kind of building up this long, like longer term structure in the music without having been explicitly programmed to do so. Okay, so maybe very briefly, I just want to show you this paper. So one thing, <clears throat> so one thing that many people have suggested is that maybe the out my histogram algorithm always reaches equilibrium only because it's such a simple algorithm or only because it's so kind of constrained in a way. Um, so maybe if we had a way of generating rhythms that's more inherently chaotic, then maybe it would, it, the system as a whole would exhibit some more interesting behavior than just always reaching equilibrium. And so to look at this in a little bit more detail, uh, three of the students in this class last semester wrote this paper where they're using some deep reinforcement learning model to generate rhythms. And I, I guess I'm not in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what they actually did. But I just want to show you this basically is an example of some very nice work that's come out of this class. And in fact, uh, they published this paper in a conference over the summer and they gave a very nice presentation at the conference. And I know that it can be intimidating to all of you, or maybe to some of you, like the idea of doing work in this class that's publishable. But the reason I'm showing you this is just to let you know that you have support, like all of us are, are capable and willing to, to help you do work that you can later publish, if that's what you plan on doing. Okay. And so, yeah, just briefly to, to conclude here, so over the past 43 minutes, I've talked about many different properties of swarms. And I've shown you how these different properties, or at least how some of these different properties can give rise to intelligent musical behavior. For instance, I've talked about how self-organization can give rise to, to robots that know how to play chords. I've talked about how emergence can give rise to these kind of longer term musical structure than than the robots have been programmed to be capable of. And I started by talking out, I started out by talking about voids, right? And I talked about some of the limitations of voids, and then I've shown you how to get rid, or at least I've shown you some of my research where I've gotten rid of this spatial metaphor that's present in voids, and I try to get some of these properties back in the systems. Okay, so yeah, that's all I've got to say. Have some sewer caps. <laughs> and, uh, re remember to like and subscribe. And <laughs> if any of you have questions, I'll take them. All right, thanks, Mike. <laughs> any questions? Yes. Do you have a video with all 10? Uh, yeah, so we, so over the, two of them are permanently broken. But um, over the summer, we, I did an art installation at kind of a conference where we had all 10 robots, or we had eight robots and then two kind of software agents all playing music together. And people could join over Zoom actually and like wave their hands around in front of the camera and then the robots would kind of respond to that. And related to that, we also did a, a dance performance where we had a dancer kind of dancing with the robots and all the robots were, well, some of them were responding to the movement of the dancer, and then some of them were listening and responding to this sound. There's a video of that on my YouTube channel. <laughs>